Black Mass is a satanic version of the Christian Mass. It is believed through conspiracy circles that the Medici family of Italy started Black Masses hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years ago. The Medici family was a very powerful banking family, a bit like the Rothschilds today. And although I'm not sure if they were the ones to actually start doing Black Maths, what I do know is that conspiracies of satanic ritual abuse have followed this family through the centuries. But before we go any further, you know what to do. Please hit that subscribe button and give us a like. A very special thank you, as always, to our patrons who help support this channel. We've picked up a couple more Patreons this week, and I am extremely grateful to you. If you would like to join our Patreon program, there is a link in the description box below. Welcome to Esoteric Atlanta. My name is Bryce, and today we are going to be talking about Catherine de' Medici. Now, before we get started on our story, I do want to address that, yes, I am in a different location in my house from where I normally film. If you're new to this channel, this is normally not the background that I use. However, I do live in the middle of the city of Atlanta and there is a lot going on outside. There are a lot of sirens. There's a lot of work happening. You can probably hear them a little bit in this video. So I moved myself to a different location to try to silence it as much as I could for your listening pleasure. Also, before we get started, as you guys know, Tom Sidney Bushnell, aka Numbers, and my friend Anna Marins are two people who come on this channel a lot to talk about Demontria and the world around us. Our last interview with Tom, I told you guys that he was going to be opening up a Patreon account, and he has opened up that account. So if you would like to support Tom's work or Anna's work, I'm going to also put their Patreon links in the description box too, as well as a link to their channels. And be on the lookout because we are gonna do another round table with Tom and Anna and David Zublik. We're gonna be working on that this weekend. So hopefully by next week, you guys will have access to that interview. I'm super excited because as you guys know, David is one of the OGs in this truth or community. He has a lot of experience and I cannot wait to see him and Tom together and Anna as well to see what kind of conversation we can have around the gematria and all the things happening in our world today. All right, let's get started talking about Catherine Didimeci. Now, who was she? Well, Catherine was the queen consort of France from 1547 to 1559. Catherine was a very polarizing character, even in her time period. A bit like our banking families to today, in our modern day times, the Demetis were extremely powerful. Even though they were not of royal blood, so therefore they were considered commoners, they were elite commoners. And their family wealth and power was so potent that a lot of these members of the Demetri family ended up in very powerful roles throughout all of these kingdoms during this time period. Again, Catherine herself became the Queen of France. Her uncle and great uncles all were popes of the Roman Catholic Church. The Demetis were known to work in bribery where they would bribe people for power. They would bribe the Catholic Church. They also were no strangers to plots of conspiracy and murder. And yes, just as our banking families are suspected of practicing forms of Satanism today, the Demetis also carried these stories of perhaps allegedly participating in Satanism. And not only was Catherine de' Medici, again, a very polarizing character in our historical narrative, but there are many, many, many rumors of her involvement in things like cannibalism, SRA, 
as well as working with black magic and dabbling into the dark occult. In fact, in 1555, Catherine brought the very famous Nostradamus, the astrologer Nostradamus, into the French court to work with her. Then in 1574, she actually built a tower on one of their properties that was used as her place to conduct spells and study the occult. Now, interestingly enough, the tower is still standing even though the building itself is not. At the time, many people called Catherine the Serpent Queen. Now again, Catherine's family was heavily involved in the Catholic Church. She had a lot of family members who were popes. We know the Vatican does mean head of the serpent, and we know that there are a lot of satanic references within Catholic masses anyway, without even going into the idea of a black mass. I will also say that with her being known as the Serpent Queen, Nostradamus himself is rumored to have given her a talisman that was full of precious metals, goat's blood, as well as human blood that she carried around with her. Catherine was also said to have liked having dwarfs, little people around her at all times, because apparently at that time in the occult, having a little person with you was considered good luck. Um, this was new information to me. I've never heard this before, but if you know more about this, please be sure to let me know in the comment section below. As we go forward too, I just want to say regarding little people, I believe obviously that little, little people are just like everybody else. They just have a smaller body. So I don't believe that there isn't any potency to any particular person over the other. I think this is just a legend that lived during these times. Catherine also used a tactic that we know today as a honeypot. For example, things that Epstein did on his island. Catherine had a ring of about 300 women of all ranks who she called her flying squadron, who would go around and seduce powerful men in order to get information from them to bring back to Catherine. Some things just never change. In Like Epstein Island, Catherine has also been accused of perhaps participating in child sacrifice. In fact, Catherine and her husband Henry would end up having a lot of children themselves, which we'll get into when we go through her life. And it was one of her daughters, whom we've spoken about before in our uh, King Henry IV missing head episodes on him, his first wife, Margaret, who wrote a memoir where she spoke about intense abuse from her mother and even being abused in a particular way that I can't say on YouTube by her own brothers. So this isn't just merely speculation. We actually do have historic accounts from one of her own children talking about the type of trauma that she put her kids through. This is the same type of trauma that whistleblowers speak about today who were themselves also born into these very powerful cabal families. If you ever take tours in France of the properties that were owned by the French royal family, there is one chateau in particular that has a room of 237 drawers that Catherine used allegedly to hide all of her poisons. Poisons were a really great way to take somebody out, if you know what I mean, especially for women, since women are not typically as strong as men, it's a way to get people out of the way that doesn't require brute force. The Medici's of Italy were also notoriously known for using poison to take out their competition or their enemies. This murder by poison will come up in Catherine's story a lot. Catherine had a favorite son, again, which we will get into, and that was her son, Henry. We briefly spoke about Henry in our episode on King Henry IV. Her son, Henry, was King Henry IV's cousin, and he apparently was also trained in the black arts by his mother. 
Because these people are legitimate psychopaths, they tend to have one child that they put all of their energy to, the golden child, where all the other children become scapegoats and children used to place their abuse, if you know what I mean. So let's get into Catherine's story. Catherine's story actually starts before her birth with King Francis I of France. King Francis I would go on to be Catherine's father-in-law, but long before Catherine was born, King Francis I wanted to retain power over Naples in Italy. And back in those days, a way to really hold on to a treaty with another empire was to propose your offspring into marriage with an offspring of that other empire. We know that the royal family all over Europe got married for political treaties all the time, never for love, but political alliances. The Pope at this time was Pope Leo X. Now, Pope Leo X was a Medici. He was part of this royal banking family. And we know that the Pope has wielded just as much power as any king back in these days. Now, King Francis I came to Pope Leo X and said, I want to make a treaty with you, an agreement with you. I will let you retain power over all the churches in France if you support me in my quest for taking Naples for the Empire of France. Well, seeing that the Roman Catholic Church is one of the most corrupt and power-hungry organizations in the world, Pope Leo X, who again was part of the ruthless Medici family, made an agreement with Francis I on December the 8th of 1515. To solidify this agreement, King Francis I offered one of his family members, a woman, a young woman named Madeline, up to Pope Leo X's nephew, Lorenzo de Medici. These two were Catherine's parents. Now for the Medicis, who were again one of the most powerful families in Europe, marrying into the French royal family meant that they were now intermingling into the elite royal blood, which within all their power was something they didn't have yet. And for the French royal family, they now had ties to the Catholic Empire. This was a win-win for everyone. Catherine was born on April 13th, 1519. She was born in Florence, which was basically the motherland for the Medici clan. Although Catherine's family were said to be super excited about her birth, her parents did not live long after her birth. It seems her mother died and then a few weeks later, her father died. They were both very young. Her father, we know for sure, died of syphilis. It is believed her mother also died of syphilis, although a lot of historical accounts say she actually died of the plague. Sometimes I wonder if both of her parents had syphilis, did the effects of this sickness get passed on to Catherine while she was in the womb? And could this be the reason for some of her behavior problems, for lack of a better word, that she would go on to have in life. Although I highly doubt it, seeing that this, her behavior problems at least, were pretty typical of the Medici family. After her parents' death, Catherine went to live with her father's mother, her nana on the Medici side. Like that, that's, that's typical, right? Like if, if your parents die, typically the kid will go live with the grandparents. And seeing that her mother's family was in France, she obviously then went to her father's side of the family, really being interwoven into this Medici culture. Well, a few years later, her grandmother passed away as well. So then she went to live with her aunt, her father's sister. Well, all that changed again in 1521 when Pope Leo X 
passed away. Again, he was a Medici and because he was the Pope, he helped keep the Medici banking family in power and in the nobility. For a couple of years, there was some intensity around her life until Pope Clement came on the scene and Pope Clement was also a Medici. In fact, in 1523, when Pope Clement II was elected to the seat of the Pope, Catherine was moved out again to another location. She was sent to live at the Plaza Medici Riccardi, which was a family estate in Italy. Now, this estate still exists today, but it's a public museum. So if you're ever in the area of Florence, I would definitely go check out this public museum and see the the elegance and the the wealth that the Medici family had back in those days. In fact, many historians will tell you that However powerful you think the Rothschilds are today, the Medicis were 10 times as powerful back in their day. Now in 1527, trouble was abound. There was a group of people in Italy who wanted to overthrow Pope Clement. I guess back in those days, people were having problems with banking families as well, just like we are today. In order to take Pope Clement down, they figured they had to take down the actual nucleus, the Medici nucleus first. And so they came into the city and they actually succeeded in overthrowing the Medicis for a small time being. At this point, Catherine was taken hostage. Many people supporting the overthrow of the Medici family wanted Catherine murdered or executed as soon as possible. Now at this point, Catherine was not even 10 years old. She was still a small child. In 1529, two years after the whole rebellion started, Charles, the Holy Roman Emperor, came into Florence and decided that he was either going to possibly hang Catherine's naked body up on chains outside the city walls or either take her and pass her around his troops to be R-A-P-E-D because I can't say that word on YouTube. We know the Medicis are bad people, but crap, this guy coming in to take over Florence obviously isn't at that great either if that's what he wants to do to a little girl. And even though Catherine would go on to be a very evil person, I do have empathy for her at this time. I can't imagine what she went through. But before any of that could happen, her uncle, Pope Clement II, came in and got Catherine and brought her down to Rome to live under his protection. They say that he wept with tears of joy when his niece was brought back into his care safely. Pope Clement at that point decided the best situation for Catherine in order to keep her safe was to start the process of finding a husband for her. Four years later, King Francis I, the same King Francis who had made the treaty with Pope Leo X, approached Pope Clement VII and proposed his second son, Henry, the Duke of Orleans, to Catherine in marriage. Again, this was very exciting. This was a royal bloodline that was asking for this banking family's daughter to be married into their fold. So of course, once again, Pope Clement jumped on the opportunity. At 14 years old, Prince Henry, the Duke of Orleans, and Catherine were married. They say that Catherine was a very small girl. At this point, she at 14, you're not really a woman, even though they were considered adults at 14 back then. They're not, they're 14, but they were very small. And so it is believed that Catherine was the first woman in the European court to wear high heels. She wanted to wear these high heels so that she would match in stature with her new husband. The two were married on October 28, 1533, 
And it gets even creepier because after they were married, they were ushered into the marriage chamber where Francis I, the king of France and the father of the groom and the father-in-law of the new bride, watch them consummate their marriage. I gross. I mean, I guess that's what Satanists do anyway. They, they have a very different relationship with relate sexual relations than normal people, but so disgusting. And then the next morning, to make matters worse, Pope Clement VII, her uncle, came in into their bedchamber where they're laying in bed and blessed their union. Now, the two 14-year-old newlyweds would spend the next 10 years basically living separate lives. We have to remember that at this point, Catherine's husband, Henry, was second in line for the throne. He had an older brother who was the Dauphin of France or the heir of France. And if once he was married and have kids, it would push Henry further down the line. And so, you know, at this point, like if they're not spending a lot of time together, whatever, because they're just nobility. Well, the young Henry ended up taking a mistress that would be the love of his life for the rest of his life. This was a woman by the name of Diane de Poitier. Now, Diane was like 38 to this 14 year old. So this in itself is also very disturbing. And in this time period would be absolutely considered illegal. Again, we do know that in satanic families, this type of practice is not uncommon and is in fact encouraged. But for us normal people, that's a little gross. Now for a while, it doesn't appear as Catherine really minded the affair. Again, these were two 14 year old kids and they really didn't know each other and here they are like married now. She didn't mind the affair until Diane gave birth to a child, Henry's child, and Henry actually recognized the child. This, of course, put some pressure on Catherine. One of the duties of a noble wife, especially in a royal family, was to produce children for the dynasty, for the lineage. And seeing that France practice celiac law, which meant that the crown could only be passed down to sons, it was really important for her to get the ball rolling to get some males in the picture in case anything were to happen to Henry's older brother, which we know something does happen to Henry's older brother. In fact, it is suspected that Catherine had a lot to do with what happened to Henry's older brother. Francis, Henry's older brother was playing tennis one day. He took a swig of water and then he got really sick and died. It is believed that there was possibly poison in the water. Again, we know the Medicis are very famous for killing people with poison. Yes, we know Catherine was very, very young at the time, but she had been groomed and raised to work in this manner. Again, we don't know for sure if she was responsible for his death, but it is highly suspect, seeing that Francis, the Dauphin, the oldest son, was healthy. In fact, he was, again, he's playing tennis before he died. He wasn't sickly. Well, his death happened in 1536, and of course, immediately after he died, that placed Catherine's husband, Henry, as the Dauphin, as the person to inherit the kingdom of France. So that meant that Catherine was now going to be, eventually one day, the queen consort of France. That also meant that any sons Catherine had would eventually also be kings of France. After Francis's death in 1536, Catherine was desperate to get pregnant. She had a really hard time conceiving a child. In fact, Henry's mistress, Diane de Poitiers, really encouraged Henry to go visit his wife to try to create an heir to the empire of France. At this point, it is said that Catherine started to get involved more into black magic to make herself fertile. There are even rumors that she used cow dung on her lady parts in order to increase her fertility. That is so disgusting and to me sounds more like birth control than birth enhancement. Catherine also started to get nervous as well because if she could not produce an heir to the French throne, there was a possibility that 
her father-in-law, King Francis I, could inquire about a divorce so that Henry could marry a woman who was more fertile. There is also speculation that her husband Henry had penile deformities to an extent. I don't really know how that works. There were no pictures of that back then. But their doctor came and worked with them on how to position themselves so that Henry could impregnate Catherine. And whatever happened, whether it was helping them reposition themselves in the bedroom or the cow dung or black magic, I don't know. Whatever they were doing, eventually it worked because in 1544, Catherine gave birth to a son. Catherine would go on to have eight children with Henry. Six of them lived to adulthood, but she had multiple boys. And we talked about these boys on our episode of King Henry IV of France. These boys were King Henry IV's cousins. Three years after Catherine and Henry's first son was born, a son they also named Francis. The King of France, Francis I, Henry's father and Catherine's father-in-law, and little Francis's grandfather passed away. Catherine was coronated as the Queen of France on June the 10th of 1549. Around this time, King Henry II, now he's King Henry II, his love affair with Diane de Poitiers intensified. And it wasn't just the fact that he was in love with this woman and obviously not in love with his wife, but what really bothered Catherine the most was that Henry gave Diane a sense of power in court that he did not give his wife, who was by title the actual queen of France. In fact, there's a very famous chateau that a lot of the uh, French queens have inherited over the years, and Henry decided to give that chateau to Diane de Poitiers instead of Catherine. Not only that, but he would seek the advice of Diane de Poitiers in political matters of government, and he would not allow Catherine to be involved in any of this. So in my opinion, the tension between Catherine and Diane was not because of romance in love. It wasn't like Catherine, I believe anyway, was super jealous of the fact that her husband was in love with another woman. Their marriage was arranged anyway, and they were obviously getting busy in the bedroom because they had a lot of kids. But it was the fact that Henry actually gave Diane power power that any Medici has fought tooth and nail to have throughout the centuries. And Catherine was getting shut out of all of it. She was just like a baby making machine for the French empire. In my opinion, it is because of this that Catherine probably got even more involved in the black arts. Again, this was how she was raised. She was raised in this faith, this satanic faith, but I think she really started to rely on the occult and her, her honeypot of women to try to gain whatever power she could given the circumstances. Now, as I said, even though Henry did not value Catherine as a powerful asset of government, he was still visiting her bedroom and still impregnating her from time to time. Again, they had eight children. In 1556, Catherine gave birth to their last babies. It was two twin girls named Joan and Victoria. Now this pregnancy and this delivery was extremely traumatic and Catherine almost lost her life. In order to save Catherine's life, the physician had to break the legs of the infant Joan who had died in the womb. Once the other baby was delivered Victoria, she didn't live much long after and ended up passing away as well, this would be the last delivery and the last pregnancy for Catherine and Henry. In 1559, the French Empire signed a treaty with Spain. And again, just like Catherine's parents, with any good treaty, there comes a marriage. And so their daughter Elizabeth was given to Philip II of Spain. 
They had what they called a proxy wedding, where somebody came and stood in for the groom. During this proxy wedding or this actual wedding with a proxy person, there were days and days of celebration within the Fran France Empire. The whole country was celebrating. This again was bringing about a treaty of alliance between France and Spain. So this was good news really for the whole country. Well, of course, during this time, one of the main festivities was an activity called jousting. I know I've spoken about jousting before. Jousting was like very, very brutal. And a lot of people got hurt jousting, like Henry VIII got hurt jousting. Well, King Henry II decided to joust that day on his wooden, spear, he put the colors of his lover, Diane. That's kind of embarrassing, right? If your husband's like wearing your, your, his mistresses, your nemesis, her colors on his jousting spear, that had to have been mortifying for Catherine. Although I know that in France, especially a lot of these royal mistresses were not kept a secret. Well, anyway, during the joust, a wooden spear got smashed through Henry's eye. So disgusting. And they said that during the event, Catherine, Diane de Poitiers, and their son Francis all passed out when it happened. I probably would have passed out too. I mean, that's disgusting. They said from the accounts I read, you could see bits of wood coming out of Henry's skull. Henry only lived a few days after he was rushed to his bed and Catherine did stay by his bedside. They said as he was dying, he was asking for Diane de Poitiers, whom Catherine would not let in. It is also rumored that after that during that time, Diane also said that she was um very nervous about getting near the bedchamber because she actually feared Catherine. Catherine wasn't called the Serpent Queen for nothing. I think Diane de Poitiers knew exactly who Catherine was, what she got up to, and obviously knew about her family and their antics as well. I probably would have stayed away too if I were Diane. And you also have to remember that Diane was also the mother of some of Henry's children. So she probably felt inclined to try to protect her own kids from Catherine as well. Well, after Henry died, Catherine took to wearing all black all the time. It is also rumored that she had a bit of the spear that pierced her husband's eye that she kept on her as well. Really gross and weird. Maybe that's part of the satanic fate. I don't know, but that's just really disturbing. After Henry's death, his, his and Catherine's son, Francis, who became King Francis II took the throne. At this time, Francis II was 15 years old and therefore could rule by himself. On a side note, Francis II was married at that point to Mary, Queen of Scots, whom we've talked about on this channel. Mary, Queen of Scots is one of my ancestors. Mary, Queen of Scots' mother was of the French nobi nobility. She was the Guise, the Guise family. And one of Mary's uncles moved into the Louvre Palace with Francis II and Mary, Queen of Scots to help advise them on the doings of the French Empire. Well, Catherine took her opportunity as well. Even though Catherine really had no power because she was only a consort queen, meaning she wasn't born into the royal family, she still was the queen mother. And so she attempted to work with the Guise brothers to help monitor the young couple. At this point too, we have some Protestant uprisings. We know this from our look at King Henry IV, who was a cousin to King Francis II, and King Henry IV was also a Protestant, whereas the French royal family were very much Catholic. Remember, Catherine herself, some of her uncles were popes. This has absolutely fuck all to do with spirituality and faith and very much to do with power and control. Well, the Guise brothers started to attack the Protestants and Catherine supported them. She supported their hunting down these Protestants. In my opinion, again, she did this for multiple reasons. Number one, she had ties to the Catholic 
Vatican power source and that was her family's power source and also she wanted to make sure she stayed on the good side of this particular family so that she could maintain some control over France. It is also noted very sadistically that Catherine very much enjoyed watching the Protestants being tortured to death. You have to be a psychopath to enjoy that. And not only was Catherine a psychopath and a Satanist, but she was also petty AF. She made Diane de Poitiers hand over the chateau that her husband Henry had given Diane when he was alive. Talk about being savage. Catherine's son, Francis II, who was also now the King of France, passed away in December of 1560. It says that he died of an ear infection. Now, it is important to know that Francis II was always sickly. He was never a healthy child. So yeah, I think at that time, an ear infection probably could have pushed him over the edge and he died. Well, because he and Mary, Queen of Scots, were so young when they got married, they didn't have any children. This was really lucky for me because if Mary, Queen of Scots, and Francis II had had children, then Mary, Queen of Scots, probably would have stayed in France and helped her son, her, her heir, rule France. But because they didn't have any children, Mary, Queen of Scots, went back to Scotland, her homeland, where she eventually had James, who was King James I of England, who was again one of my ancestors. So if King Francis II had not died in 1560, very selfishly, I would not be here today. The next son in line for the throne was Charles, Catherine's son, Charles, with Henry II of France. Charles was nine years old when his older brother died and he became basically the king of France at nine years old. Because he was so young, Catherine had to step in as regent to help him rule. So basically, she took total control of the French government. I mean, I think any mother would do that because a nine-year-old, I mean, they can't rule. So of course, the adult's going to step in for their child to make sure that the country doesn't go to hell in a handbasket. Charles was so young that at his coronation, he cried. He basically threw a temper tantrum at his coronation. And I kind of giggle, but I find that a little bit endearing because he was just a little boy. My nephew is eight years old. My nephew is only a little bit younger than the age of Charles when he was handed the keys to the kingdom. I definitely know that my nephew, who's also named Charles or Charlie, would much rather be playing Legos than being put in a pompous ceremony of coronation. It also appears out of all of her children, Charles and Margaret were the two kids who were abused the most by Catherine. After Charles was coronated the King of France, Catherine took to sleeping in his bed with him. Now I know that children will sleep in their parents' bed a lot. I know when my niece and nephew get afraid at night, they'll go get in my sister's bed. I know my sister complains about it sometimes that she didn't get a lot of sleep because she had both her kids in the bed with them. But this was odd enough to be written down in the history books. So what exactly was Catherine doing to Charles at night in that bedroom? We know that she was accused of abusing her children, but what kind of abuse? happened to Charles. During this time, the country of France broke out into basically civil war. We talked about that again with our King Henry IV episode, which again, I will place in the description box below if you have not seen that and want some backstory on that. We know that this war was going on between the Huguenots or the Protestants and the Catholics. This was the French wars of religion. During this time of civil war, Catherine was totally in control. In fact, at this time of her oldest son's death, when her second son took power, we're now entering into the age of Catherine, where Catherine pretty much ruled through her children. 
In fact, in 1563, Charles became of an age where he did not need a regent anymore, where he could make decisions on his own. But he was so uninterested in government that he requested his mother continue to rule as his regent. I think he was probably so heavily abused by his mother that there was a lot of trauma there. He probably just was not of sound mind to be able to help, you know, it's, it's trauma, it's PTSD, but that's just my opinion. Again, I wasn't there at the time, but from the research and from the accounts of historians that I've read, that seems to be, to me, what was going on. In fact, during this time, as you know, from our previous stories, Catherine was going head to head against Queen Joan of Navarre, who was King Henry of Navarre's mother. Joan was a Huguenot and a very powerful person in her, her own right. She was legitimately born into the French royal family. And even though Catherine de Medici was born into a very powerful banking family, Joan had something that Catherine didn't have. Joan had royal blood. Catherine tried to do everything to take power away from Joan, including a smear campaign. It is written in one of Catherine's letters that she called Joan the most shameless woman who ever lived. Seems quite funny coming from a woman who was called the Serpent Queen. In 1570, the French royal army ran out of cash. If, you're, if your army has no money, you can't fight these war, and it's just bad for everyone. And so Catherine schemed up a marriage between her son, Charles, and Elizabeth of Austria. Elizabeth of Austria was the daughter of Maximilian II, who at that time was the Holy Roman Emperor. This would give the France, the French army and the French empire access to money through her new daughter-in-law's dowry. Something else happened as well. Catherine's daughter, who had married Philip II of Spain, which was the catalyst for King Henry II's death through jousting, passed away giving birth. At that point, Catherine was thinking about sending her other daughter, Margaret, who was heavily abused by her mother, down to Philip to keep that alliance strong. Margaret would then go in and be Philip's second wife. However, because of what was happening in Navarre with Joan, her nemesis, she decided to offer up Margaret instead to King Henry of Navarre, Joan's son, who at that point was just a prince. She thought by marrying Margaret to Henry, Joan's son, they could possibly have some sort of alliance or Catherine could possibly take more control. Margaret at that time was involved in a love affair with Henry of Giza. So one of the Guise brothers who were kind of fighting with Catherine for control of power that she tried to ally with to keep control. Anyway, from all accounts, it does seem that Margaret was in love with Henry. This was an actual love relationship. And as I've said, Margaret took a lot of her mother's abuse, as did her brother Charles. Well, Catherine was so upset with Margaret because she wanted to use Margaret as her proxy that she pulled Margaret out of the bed one night and had her son Charles beat Margaret, ripping off her clothes and ripping out her hair. Catherine also took part in this beating as well. Now, nowadays, if a mother beat her child so hard and ripped hair out, people would come take the child away. And the fact that Catherine did this to her daughter and got her son to beat up Margaret as well is just trauma that is beyond my comprehension. Catherine then invited Joan of Navarre to come up to Paris so that they could arrange a wedding between their children who were cousins again. Catherine assured Joan that she would not hurt Joan or her children. In a letter that Joan wrote back to Catherine, I, I think we see a lot in this one line, which I will read to you. Joan writes, pardon me if reading that I want to laugh because you want to relieve me of a fear that I've never had. I never thought that as they say, you eat little children. I find that very interesting that there were rumors, obviously, from Joan's letter going around the court that Catherine ate children. 
we know what goes on today with these elite family members and from all the other evidence of what Catherine got up to, it would not shock me if these rumors were true. The wedding was arranged, but unfortunately, Joan, the Queen of Navarre, would not live to see her son get married. Joan died on June 19th of 1572 while she was in Paris shopping for clothes to wear to the wedding. They say that Catherine had sent Joan a pair of gloves and within these gloves, there was poison. So here we have yet another death, possibly by poison, possibly by Catherine de Medici. Now in our part one of King Henry IV of France, we talked about the St. Bartholomew Day Massacre, which is what happened when Henry of Navarre married Margaret, Catherine's daughter. Apparently Catherine was most likely behind this massacre where all these prominent Protestant noblemen came up to Paris to witness this wedding. And while they were there, they were attacked and slaughtered. We know that Henry himself, eventually Henry that would become King Henry IV, Margaret's husband barely escaped alive. We know that Margaret and Henry were never really romantically involved, but they do seem to be great allies. Again, they were cousins and they did seem to protect each other all throughout their lives against Margaret's mother, Catherine de Medici. Margaret took Henry in during this massacre and he promised to convert to Catholicism and that is what kept him alive. I believe that Catherine was using her daughter Margaret as a pawn to get Joan and Henry up into Paris to have both of them killed. So therefore this house of Bourbon down in Navarre would not be of any competition to her or her children. However, Henry did not die. In 1574, Charles died at the age of 23. It is believed that he too was poisoned by his mother. The thing is, her next child in line, who was also named Henry, King Hen who would become King Henry III, was her favorite child. And again, as I said in the beginning of this story, it is believed that he was the golden child. It seems that Henry III was just as sadistic, if not more sadistic than his mother, Catherine, and that she taught him all the ways of the black mass, of human sacrifice, and of black magic. People have horrifying stories about King Henry III. However, at the time of Charles' death, King Henry III had been elected to rule over Poland. So King Henry III, now King Henry III, is not in France. And so on Charles' deathbed, he made his mother once again regent of France to rule for his brother Henry, who happened to be over in Poland doing God knows what to the Polish people as a, an elected ruler. Three months though after Charles died, Henry like up and left Poland. He was like, see you later, I'm done. He just abandoned his duties and went to France to rule his homeland of France. Then in 1576, Catherine's youngest son, Francois, also died. Now the death is ruled as consumption, but once again, it is believed that perhaps Catherine wanted to get him out of the way so that he would not try to take Henry out so that her golden child, her satanic, sadistic golden child could rule France through his eventual heirs. The only problem is Henry did not have any heirs. And over time, it became apparent that it was possible that Henry was not fertile. So now this meant that the heir after King Henry III died would in fact be King Henry IV and her daughter Margaret as the queen. So she had used Margaret to try to take down Henry and Joan. But now that Henry and Margaret were the heirs under King Henry III, she needed to use Margaret in a different way. By 1582, it was well known that Margaret and Henry of Navarre 
had started to take lovers. Again, they were never romantically interested in each other, but were pretty good allies and friends for each other. I don't think that each other minded that the other one had had a lover because I think they knew that they needed each other to survive. Well, because Margaret was Catherine's only path to maintain her power, she now needed Margaret to be loyal to Henry and get rid of her lovers. She summoned Margaret to come back up to Paris to visit her dear mother. At that point, it is said that you could hear Catherine beating and screaming and abusing Margaret for having all these lovers. It would have been terrible if Margaret had gotten pregnant with someone who was not nobility. And that was all that Catherine cared about. In 1585, in order to escape the abuse of her mother, Margaret fled out of Navarre. She ended up going to another property that she owned in the south of France. At that point, she ran out of money and she had to ask her mother to send some. Her mother, being the vindictive bitch that she was, only sent Margaret enough money to barely put food on her table. While in her property down in France trying to hide from her mother, but also her mother being her only means of financial support, Margaret took another lover. When Catherine found out about that, she ordered her son, King Henry III, to act. In 1586, she had Margaret locked up in the tower, basically, as cliche as that sounds, and had her lover executed. Now, Catherine had demanded that her lover be executed in front of Margaret, but as sadistic as her son Henry was, he did not do that to his sister. And Catherine was pretty disappointed that her own child did not have to go through that trauma of watching her lover executed. Catherine definitely does not win Mother of the Year, that is for sure. Catherine ended up cutting Margaret out of her will, this massive Demetri will, and she never saw Margaret again. Now again, Margaret did write her memoirs about being the daughter of Catherine de Demetri, and I actually do want to read those memoirs. I haven't had a chance to read them yet, but I am looking for them and would love to read to get, truly get the inside scoop on what it was like living in the 16th century in this very wealthy but very satanic family. Catherine died the 5th of January, 1589. She was 69 years old. Her son, Henry III, did not live that much longer after his mother. And Henry of Navarre, again, as we spoke about, ended up becoming King Henry IV of France. Now we know that he did end up divorcing Margaret amicably because they were not in love. And I do believe he took care of Margaret. I don't think she truly went without because he did seem to care for her as a human being. And even though Henry of Navarre was also born into one of these cabal families, he did seem to be a lot kinder and more compassionate of a person than anybody else in his family. Now in 2013, the CW released a series called Reign. This what followed Mary, Queen of Scots. And Megan Follows did play the part of Catherine de' Medici in the beginning of the series when Mary, Queen of Scots was living in France. Now, now I do have to say that Megan Follows' interpretation of Catherine de' Medici was quite humorous. Her character, Catherine de' Medici, was the comic relief of this whole story. Although one thing that really drove me crazy about this adaptation of this story by the CW is it was highly fictionalized. Yes, it followed the basis of a true story, but it was so much fiction that I could not finish watching it. Now, this story has so many layers to it. I almost considered bringing this story to you guys in a live so that we could talk about it all together. I am considering doing a story on 
what a black mass entails. I don't know if YouTube will let me put up a story like that. I might do that as a live because lives are different than pre-recorded videos like this one. If that's something you guys are interested in, then please let me know in the comments below. I know talking about topics like a black mass are super dark and some people might not want to go there. For me, it's just very interesting. I feel like knowledge is power. And the more we know about these things that have been going on in our world, then that means they won't happen again. And again, I'll say, as I said before, what somebody believes religiously is, is I'm not going to try to change their beliefs. You can believe whatever you want to believe as far as your faith and your religion. That's your business. That's between you and God. But when your religious beliefs start hurting other people, especially to the point of violence, especially when ritualistic abuse is part of your faith, then we have a problem and this should not be done. It's also interesting that the more we study these historical people, we see the repetition throughout the history. Our favorite military back channel often says that the future proves the past. And I find it very interesting that the more we learn about the goings on of these banking families today and these royal families today and all these bloodlines, we see the same thing happening over the years. These, these whole cabal, deep state, activities, for lack of a better word, aren't new. In fact, as we know on this channel, they've been around since the beginning of time. And now as we move into a new timeline, into the age of Aquarius, we're able to correct the course. Nobody should go through the abuse that these people have put humanity through since the beginning of time. All right, guys, thank you so much. That was a long one today. I thank you so much for sitting through that. If you've gotten this far, I really appreciate you and appreciate your participation in this story. Please let me know your thoughts in the comment section below. Thank you again to Josh McKay for doing our opening song. If you would like to purchase the opening song, there is a link again in the description box below. Thank you so much to Todd Roderick for helping me get this video out on the interwebs for you all to watch and hopefully enjoy. I will talk to you soon. Have a wonderful, wonderful weekend and a blessed day. Bye.